I am Admiral R. K. Dhawan, the former Chief of Naval Staff Indian Navy. I've spent 45 years in uniform and it has been an amazing journey from a cadet to be the Chief of the Naval Staff. India is essentially a maritime nation with a natural outflow towards the seas. And the easiest way to understand the maritime perspective is to put the map of India and the Indian Ocean region upside down. When we do that, we quickly lose our continental focus and we realize that we in India need to look outwards towards the seas which surround us from three sides. It also brings home the fact that we are heavily dependent on the seas for our external trade, for our resources, for our prosperity and maritime security. I will be speaking today on India's maritime heritage as well as the opportunities and challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. India's vast maritime interests as enablers for harnessing the blue economy and the potential of India as a growing maritime power and a resurgent maritime nation in the 21st century. The subject of my talk is related to the seas and the oceans, and it would be of great interest to all those who have donned the white uniform. But I would like to say that it would be of equal interest to all others as well, because we are all tied and connected to the oceans. And I would like all of you to reflect on an interesting biological fact that we have in our veins the same percentage of salt in our blood, which is the same percentage of salt in the oceans. And this is true, not only about the salt in our blood, but also the salt in our sweat and in our tears. We are all therefore tied and connected to the oceans. And whenever we go back to the seas, whether to sail on them or merely watch them, we get the feeling of going back where we came from. This truly defines the relationship of humankind with the oceans and perhaps also the reason why talking about the seas brings out such passion in us. India has a glorious maritime heritage spanning over 5,000 years. In 2016, the Indian Navy published a book titled India's Maritime Heritage, which provides insight and glimpses into India's rich maritime and cultural heritage spanning over centuries. The Indian seaboard has been the vortex of intense maritime activity over centuries. The Indus Valley Civilization, which existed in the western part of the country, dates back to 3300 BC. And the recent findings indicate that the civilization may be much older. Even today, we have a dry dock at Lothal in Gujarat, which dates back to 2200 BC. It is from these ports that ancient mariners sailed off to distant lands in Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, and east coast of Africa. On the east coast of India, we had the seafaring kingdom of the Kalingas, and the Bay of Bengal, as we know today, was then called the Sea of Kalinga. Further south, we had the seafaring kingdoms of the Cholas, the Pandya, the Pallavas, and the Cheras, and seafarers from these kingdoms sailed off to countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia, and even today, we can see glimpses of India's glorious cultural and maritime heritage in these countries. Historians have recorded that around the 16th century, India had the largest GDP in the world with about 27% of the world's wealth. But we lost supremacy of the seas because of sea blindness and neglect of the waters around us. This led to the arrival of the European powers and the first to arrive was the Portuguese sailor Vasco da Gama, who landed on the shores of Calicut on 20th of May, 1498. The Portuguese were followed by the Dutch, the British, and the French. 
There is a harsh lesson of history here, which we must never forget. That neglect of our maritime frontiers and neglect of our maritime security led to the loss of our very independence for centuries. It is not a very well known fact that the British period in India was also a period of extensive shipbuilding and warship building. When the British arrived, they found a unique combination of the Malabar teak wood on the west coast of India and the shipbuilders of Gujarat. With this combination, they started building ships at the Bombay docks in Mumbai. Commencing 1735, about 144 merchant vessels and 115 warships, including 84 gunships for the Royal Navy, were built at Bombay docks. Some of the most famous ships in the world were built during that period. One of the oldest warships afloat in the world today is HMS Trincomalee, which is birthed in Hartlepool on the east coast of United Kingdom. HMS Trincomalee was built in 1817, 200 years ago at Bombay Docks. The national anthem of United States of America, the Star Spangled Banner, was written by Francis Scott Key in Baltimore on board a ship HMS Minden. And that ship HMS Minden, ladies and gentlemen, was built in India. The Treaty of Nanking, ceding Hong Kong to the British, was signed by the Chinese on board another famous warship, HMS Cornwallis, on 29th of August, 1842. And yes, you guessed it right, HMS Cornwallis was also built in India. Regrettably, when the transition took place from sail to steam and wood to steel, India got left behind because we were then not part of the Industrial Revolution. The revival of our maritime capabilities took place post-independence in the latter part of the 20th century when our leaders realize that to be secure on land, you need to be supreme at sea. Today, India occupies a dominant position in the Indian Ocean, which is the third largest water body spanning an area of 68.5 million square kilometers, and countries on the rim of the Indian Ocean are home to nearly one third of humanity. When we add the 35 countries, of the Asia-Pacific region, then the entire Indo-Pacific region is home to nearly 60% of the world's population. The trade and the avenue and entry into the Indian Ocean region is through vital choke points. And about 120,000 ships transit every year, carrying 66% of the world's oil 50% of the world's container traffic, and 33% of the world's cargo traffic. Approximately a billion tons of oil transits through the Indian Ocean every year. And these oil arteries and trade routes lead further east to the ASEAN and countries like Japan, South Korea, and China. But the seas are no longer a benign medium and globalization has resulted in vulnerability of the oceans. The threats and challenges on the waters of the Indo-Pacific are as wide and varied as they come. Who could have imagined that in the 20th century, we would once again be grappling with pirates or that the major threat in the maritime domain would be from asymmetric challenges and maritime terrorism. But that is a reality today. And the other challenges include arms trafficking, drug smuggling, human trafficking, and poaching, or illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Another challenge on the waters of the Indian Ocean is that indiscriminate pollution of the seas has resulted in a detrimental impact of climate change on the oceans. Consequently, a large percentage of extreme climate conditions turn into natural disasters. And this places the countries of the Indian Ocean virtually in the eye of the storm. And our navies and coast guards 
have to be ready to provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. The instabilities and turbulence in some parts of the Indo-Pacific region have the potential to spill over into the maritime domain and the situation can best be described as fragile. Consequently, over 120 warships from over 20 navies are always present in the Indian Ocean to safeguard their maritime interests. India has advocated adherence to international law and maintenance and promotion of peace and stability, maritime safety and security, freedom of navigation and overflight in the region. An aspect about international law, which is the cause for concern, is that the high seas, which cover nearly 50% of the Earth's surface, are the least protected areas on the planet. There is no internationally binding treaty for legislation of areas beyond national jurisdiction. This lack of legislation was addressed by the UN General Assembly in 2004 and an ad hoc informal working group constituted to address the issue. The working group held several meetings over the years and finally drafted an international legally binding instrument and submitted it to the UN General Assembly in July 2017. On 24th of December 2017, the UN General Assembly decided to convene an intergovernmental conference to negotiate the treaty under the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. It was decided to negotiate the treaty over four sessions between 2018 and 2020. The first three sessions were held in September 2018, April 2019, and August 2019. The final session at the UN headquarters is scheduled between February and April 2020. At this point, therefore, it can best be considered as work in progress. There are no boundaries on the high seas, and the maritime domain is distinctly different with regard to the security perspective to the environment prevailing on land or in the air. And I would like to illustrate this with an example. If the army was to find soldiers from another army peering down their pickets on the border one morning, it will be cause for grave alarm because the land border has been violated. If the Air Force fighter aircraft found a fighter aircraft from another Air Force flying in its vicinity in the air, it will be cause for very grave alarm because now the airspace has been violated. But out at sea, when the officer of the watch of a warship reports to the captain that, sir, we have a warship from another Navy on the starboard bow, he tells him, son, flash to him good morning because she is in international waters and so are you. This indicates the unique environment in the maritime domain of freedom of navigation and to maintain this, we will have to have a rules-based international order. Our blue planet, the Earth, has a dominance of the maritime domain with over 70% of the Earth's surface covered by water and nearly 90% of the world's trade transiting by sea. Oceans are therefore essential to life on Earth. They are rich in oil and mineral resources. They are the suppliers of oxygen, absorbers of carbon dioxide, a virtual heat sink which has emerged as global economic highways for transport of seaborne trade. With depletion of resources on land, Humankind has turned towards the seas for resources and there is a misperception that the oceans are an unending resource base and an infinite sink. Nothing could be further away from reality. Over the past few decades, we have witnessed indiscriminate pollution of the oceans and contamination of the natural marine habitat, resulting in a detrimental impact of climate change on the oceans. Studies have indicated that nearly 
80% of all pollutants in the oceans emanate from land. And if the current rate of pollution continues in a few decades from now, we will have more plastic in the ocean than fish. The concept of blue economy, therefore, has emerged as a new paradigm. And I would like to define harnessing the blue economy as the economic development of all our maritime interests by optimal utilization of resources with minimum impact on the environment to ensure sustainable development of the oceans. As a maritime nation, India sits astride busy sea lines of communication. We have a long coastline of 7,516 kilometers, an exclusive economic zone of over 2 million square kilometers. We have over 1,300 islands and islets as part of the Andaman and Nicobar group in the Bay of Bengal and the Lakshadweep group in the Arabian Sea and islands off the west and east coast of India. 95% of India's trade by volume and 77% by value transits by sea. And this accounts for nearly 30% of the country's GDP. There have been a series of initiatives for sustainable development in the maritime domain, including the quest to harness the blue economy. Our maritime interests are enablers of our blue economy and elements of our maritime power. I will now highlight some of the sectors which are likely to witness significant growth in the coming years. India has 12 major ports and over 200 non-major ports. The current port handling capacity of 1,500 million metric tons per annum is likely to increase to 2,500 million metric tons per annum over the next 10 years. The government has launched the ambitious Sagarmala project, which is a port-led development initiative based on four pillars of port modernization, connectivity, port-led industrialization, and coastal community development. Sagarmala actually comprises over 150 projects with investment of over 70 billion US dollars. The aim is to have greenfield maritime infrastructure with minimum carbon footprint, development of transshipment hubs, enhancement of coastal shipping, and to enhance the connectivity between our ports and the hinterland through multimodal road and rail connectivity and development of inland waterways. India currently has 14,500 kilometers of navigable inland waterways. And in the first phase, about 6,000 kilometers are being developed as five major national waterways. Currently, 94% of freight in India moves by road or rail. The development of inland waterways will ensure greater connectivity and greater transportation of freight over water, which is cheaper, safer, and cleaner. India's mercantile marine and shipping industry is also likely to grow in the coming years. Currently, India has about 1,430 merchant ships. And while more than 90% of our trade transits by sea, only 7% is carried in Indian hulls. The government is therefore giving incentives for registration and flagging of ships in India so as to correct the imbalance between flag and trade. India has a vibrant shipbuilding industry with over 27 shipyards. But India's percentage of shipbuilding as compared to world shipbuilding is less than 1%. Actually, it is 0.15%. The government, therefore, has given a boost to shipbuilding, ship recycling, and the ship repair industry by according the special infrastructure status and also permitting 100% foreign direct investment into shipbuilding. But much more needs to be done. We need to draw up a national shipbuilding plan. We also need to design ships of the future in accordance with the energy efficiency design index which has been 
approved by the IMO, and these should be propelled by environmentally friendly fuel. An area I would like to specifically mention is that about warship building in India. Soon after independence, the Indian Navy made its first perspective plan in 1948. We inducted naval architects into the Navy in 1955. India built its first naval patrol vessel, INS Ajay, at Garden Reach at Kolkata in 1961. And we set up the Naval Design Directorate in 1964. So, for over 50 years now, the naval designers have been designing and our indigenous shipyards have been building ships for the Indian Navy, resulting in our transformation from a buyer's navy to a builder's navy. Today, it's a matter of great pride that nearly 50 ships and submarines are under construction for the Indian Navy in Indian shipyards, both public and private. To understand the level of indigenization in our warships, we would have to consider the ship under three basic segments, the float segment, the move, and the fight segment. In the float segment, which is the superstructure and the hull, we have achieved more than 90% indigenization. This is because warship grade steel has been developed by the DRDO and is being manufactured in country by the Steel Authority of India Limited. It would make every Indian very proud to learn that our first aircraft carrier, which is already constructed and ready at the Kochi shipyard at Cochin has been built with Indian steel. As far as the move component is concerned, that is the propulsion and the auxiliary machinery, we have achieved about 60% indigenization, but much more work needs to be done to get the major propulsion systems indigenized in India. As far as the fight component is concerned, we have made our own radars, sonars, communication systems, electronic warfare systems, combat management systems, some missiles, guns, and torpedoes. But a lot more still needs to be achieved, and this indeed is the focus of our attention. It is our endeavor that we progressively increase the indigenous content so that future warships and submarines are 100% made in India. India has a thriving fishing sector with about 250,000 fishing boats, 4 million active fishermen, 14 million who are part of the fishing community. And our annual production, which is in the region of about 11.5 million tons, makes us the second largest fish producing nation in the world. But that is only scratching the surface because 90% of fishing in Indian waters is restricted to our coastal areas, whereas we have the entire 200 nautical miles of the exclusive economic zone to be exploited. There is hardly any deep sea fishing in Indian waters, and it is said that fish in deep Indian waters are actually dying of old age. The government has promulgated the National Fisheries Policy in 2017 with a focus on deep sea as well as sustained fishing. India, as I mentioned, has over 1,300 islands and islets, and the government has prepared a comprehensive island development plan, taking into account aspects of security, economic sustenance, environment preservation, and social and cultural sustenance. The aim is to have greenfield projects with minimum carbon or zero carbon footprint to develop the cruise terminals, to develop the port infrastructure, to develop marinas, so as to promote controlled ecotourism. The development of infrastructure in the islands, particularly the Andaman Nicobar Islands, would also enhance connectivity with our literal neighbors in the east, in the Bay of Bengal, which is the largest bay in the world. 
The other areas which are likely to witness significant growth include the offshore oil and gas sector, the renewable sources of ocean energy, such as the offshore wind energy, the tidal and wave energy, and ocean thermal energy conversion, and also deep seabed mining. We can therefore see that we have an ocean of opportunities to harness the blue economy. The challenge, however, is to ensure that this will be in accordance with the sustainable development norms. The United Nations has promulgated the document Transforming Our World, Agenda 2030, and the Sustainable Development Goals, where SDG 14 deals with conservation of oceans, seas, and resources. India has made its voluntary review report to the United Nations High-Level Political Forum in July 2017. Therefore, while we are pursuing the economic development of our maritime interests, we are also committed to sustainable development. We need to ensure that this development is with minimum impact on the environment and thereby ensuring sustainable development of the oceans. India's primary area of interest in the maritime domain is the Indian Ocean region. And the secondary area of interest spans over the waters of the Indo-Pacific region. The term Indo-Pacific has moved decisively from its origins in biogeography to the realms of geopolitics. And today, the Indo-Pacific, which is essentially a confluence of two oceans, has emerged as the world's economic and strategic center of gravity in the entire maritime domain. And I will try and capture the gist which relate to international law and a rules-based international order. First, India believes that there is a need for a common rules-based international order which is equally applicable for individual nations as well as global commons. Such an order must believe in sovereignty, territorial integrity, and equality of all nations. These rules and norms must be based on consent of all and not just the power of a few. That when nations make international commitments, they must uphold them. Second, we all must have equal access and rights under the international law and freedom of navigation to common spaces both at sea and in the air. We must resolve all disputes peacefully in accordance with international law. And when we agree to live by such accord, then our sea lanes will be pathways to prosperity and corridors of peace. Third, India will promote a democratic rules-based international order in which all countries, big and small, thrive as equals. To achieve this, India will engage the world in peace, with respect, through dialogue, and total commitment to international law. The oceans and global commons are common heritage of mankind, and countries of the region need to work together to evolve a rules-based international order. The Indian Navy has emerged as a multi-dimensional network force, which is ready to take on any challenges in the maritime domain. In 2015, the Indian Navy published its revised maritime security strategy titled Ensuring Secure Seas. This strategy comprises five constituent strategies. The strategy for deterrence, the strategy for conflict, the strategy for shaping a positive and favorable maritime environment, strategy for coastal and offshore security, and the strategy for maritime force and capability development. The strategy for deterrence is the foundational strategy for India's defense. It is the primary purpose of India's armed forces to prevent conflict and coercion against India. The Indian Navy contributes towards national deterrence both at the nuclear as well as the conventional level. This is achieved by development of appropriate force structures, 
by strengthening the credibility of India's military capability, by readiness, posture and communication of intent. As far as the strategy for conflict is concerned, the Indian Navy is the primary manifestation of India's maritime military power. And at the same time, the Indian Navy has the potential to take on any challenges and threats in the maritime domain. However, it must be clearly understood that no single service can hope to fight and win a war on its own. It has to be joint operation by the armed forces. Therefore, it is said that two armies do not go to war. Neither do two navies or two air forces. Two nations go to war. And the armed forces of the country have to be united and prepare for joint operations, both for contingency as well as conflict. As far as the strategy for shaping a favorable and a positive maritime environment is concerned, it describes how the Indian Navy will expand its operational footprint across the Indo-Pacific region. To promote further cooperation across the region, we need to examine the existing connectivity options as well as the existing structures in the Indo-Pacific. As far as the connectivity options are concerned, in addition to the Belt and Road Initiative being pursued by China, we have a bouquet of options for connectivity. We have the International North-South Transport Corridor. We have the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor. We have Project Mossum, which is an initiative by India for connectivity between people and cultures. We have the Free and Open Indo-Pacific. And we have the concept of Sagar, which means the ocean and the acronym stands for security and growth for all in the region. As far as the existing structures are concerned, we find them at three levels. In the Indian Ocean, at the conceptual level, we have the concept of security and growth for all in the region. At the political level, we have the Indian Ocean Rim Association, which was established in 1997. And around 2012, maritime safety and security was added to the agenda of the IORA for promotion of cooperation among the countries of the region. At the execution level of the navies, we have the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, which is a unique initiative taken by the Indian Navy in 2008. And it, today it provides a template for promoting maritime safety, security, and cooperation among navies of the region. Similarly, in the Asia-Pacific region, at the conceptual level, we could consider the ASEAN Regional Forum. At the political level, we could consider the East Asia Summit. And at the execution level of the navies, we have the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. There is a need for greater interaction between the existing structures, particularly the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and the Western Pacific Naval Symposium to provide synergy for maritime cooperation across the Indo-Pacific. As far as the issues related to the strategy of coastal and offshore security are concerned, this provides the framework for coordination between the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the maritime agencies for security and aspects in the entire exclusive economic zone. In the aftermath of the 2611 terrorist attacks of Mumbai, the mandate of the Indian Navy was expanded to include entire maritime security, which includes coastal and offshore security. The Indian Navy has leveraged technology, and we launched our satellite Rukmini, which is a naval communication satellite in 2013. We have now an extensive NC3I network by integration of the automatic identification system chains, the coastal radar stations, and 51 stations of the Navy and the Coast Guard. The Navy also set up the Information Management and Analysis Center in 2014, and more recently, the Information Fusion Center in 2018, 
to enhance the maritime domain awareness in our waters. The Navy has also signed technical agreements with the navies and maritime agencies in the region for exchange of white shipping information to further enhance the maritime domain awareness. As far as the role related to our maritime force and capability development is concerned, in this strategy, it provides the blueprint for the future Indian Navy, which, as I said, is firmly anchored on self-reliance and indigenization. The Maritime Capability Perspective Plan is mission-based and capability-dominated. We need to ensure adequate availability of resources and budget provisions for the growth of the Indian Navy for induction of future aircraft carriers, destroyers, frigates, and submarines, both conventional and nuclear, to meet the tasks of both sea control as well as sea denial. The Indian Naval Aviation is on the threshold of transformation with the planned induction of further fighter aircraft, long-range maritime patrol and reconnaissance aircraft, multi-role helicopters, as well as the UAVs. We also need to ensure induction of cutting-edge technology into our weapons and sensors so that future Indian Navy will make a transformation from a network Navy to a network-centric Navy of the future. The Indian Navy ensures maritime security for national prosperity under four basic roles. Under the military role, it maintains a very high operational tempo or operations as well as excises and keeps the skills of its personnel honed at all times to meet various challenges. Under the constabulary role, the ships and aircraft of the Navy are deployed in our exclusive economic zone and our ships have also been deployed in the Gulf of Aden for anti-piracy patrols since 2008 and in cooperation with other navies of the world, we have managed to bring piracy under some control. More recently, our ships have been deployed in the Strait of Hormuz for safety of shipping under Operation Sankalp since 2019. Under the benign role, the Indian Navy ensures humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the aftermath of tsunamis as well as cyclones, not only to its own people, but also to our literal neighbors. We also carry out non-combatant evacuation operations. And when Yemen was in turmoil in 2015, ships of the Indian Navy were deployed to evacuate over 3,000 people, including women and children, from over 30 countries of the world. This indicates the unique brotherhood of the seas and the ability of the navies to provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. As far as the issue related to our diplomatic role is concerned, the Indian Navy shows the flag across the oceans and carries out exercises with navies of the world. We also carry out capacity building and capability enhancement initiatives for enhancement of cooperation with the navies. In order to further promote cooperation among the navies of the world, the Indian Navy conducted the International Fleet Review at Vishakhapatnam in February 2016. 50 navies of the world came together to strengthen bridges of friendship. We had over 100 ships. The series of initiatives taken by India in recent years in the maritime domain are pointers to indicate that India has once again turned towards the seas and is destined to emerge as a resurgent maritime nation. The waters of the Indo-Pacific are global economic highways and maritime interests of the countries of the region are intrinsically linked with unfettered flow of oil and trade across the region. Another unique feature of the Indian Ocean is that 80% of the oil and trade that emanates in the Indian Ocean region is extra-regional in nature. This implies that if there is any impediment to the free flow of oil or trade, 
it would have a detrimental impact, not just on the economies of the region, but the global economies as well. Safety, security, and stability on the waters of the Indo-Pacific is therefore of paramount importance. And to achieve this, networking between navies and maritime partnerships between countries of the region need to be strengthened in the coming years. In conclusion, I would like to highlight a few major takeaways. The United Nations document Transforming Our World 2030 Agenda and Sustainable Development Goal 14 provide the template for conservation of oceans, seas and resources. India now needs to draw up a comprehensive plan for sustainable development in different avenues of the maritime sector. As a maritime nation, India has tremendous potential to harness the blue economy and we need to chart a national maritime policy on the development of our maritime interests in a manner which is sustainable and in accordance with the blue economy norms. We also need to have an apex level organization for coordination and integration between various departments and agencies for economic development of our maritime interests, as well as monitoring the blue economy initiatives. In order to fully implement the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister, which is Sagar, security and growth for all in the region, we need to draw up a comprehensive maritime cooperation roadmap with other countries of the region to shape a favorable and positive maritime environment. We need to extend this to Swachh Sagar to ensure clean and healthy oceans for our future generations. The seas around us are gaining newfound importance as each day goes by. And I have no doubt that the current century is the century of the seas. As India grows as a maritime power, all elements of its maritime interests, including a strong Navy and Coast Guard, need to grow. The responsibility of protecting India's maritime interests falls squarely on the shoulders of men in white uniform, because it is the responsibility of the Navy and the Coast Guard to ensure that India's maritime interests, which have a vital relationship with the nation's economic growth, are allowed to develop unhindered, both in peace and war. Thank you. Jai Hind.